Hi, everybody. My name is William Singleton, and I wanted to first thank Mr. Jordan for hooking me up with Mrs. Reed and Mrs. Wolfgang for being here. Um, <laughs> the email was a surprise for me. Um, I kind of got it at the last minute, and I was in the middle of talking to some of the state reps about substance abuse, and they, they wanted me to talk to them whew, about an issue they were having with the um, needle, needle exchange program. And they had said that, you know, the school system is now looking for more information about drugs and alcohol. And I've been in the field for, I mean, I'm going on 20 years with my private practice. I've been in the field for like 35. And prior to this, it has always been a struggle to talk publicly about substance abuse, especially with the teenagers. So <laughs> when I was called, I, I mean, I gotta tell you, I was a little overwhelmed, you know, because it was a lot of information I have. And, and Mrs. Reed said I had two hours, but that's like a lot of time and not enough. And so, you know, I'm telling you, I, I, I went in, I went in y'all. I, I got flow charts, I had diagrams, I had bullet points, I had everything. You know, but the problem was when my friend, who's a professor, sat me down and said, okay, Will, what's gonna be the takeaway for all these professionals when they come hear you speak? And I kind of thought about it and I was like, well, uh, I mean, I've got all these myths about addictions. I've got the uh, uh, gateway drugs and gateway emotions, which nobody talks about. I've got, I've got parent stuff, I've got student stuff, I've got, I've got too much, I've got too much. So, I, you know, I had two months to prepare for this, but you know, you should know that this Monday I went back and I killed everything I wrote. <laughs> you should thank me, <laughs> but um, <laughs> I rewrote everything. Because really, truthfully, it's easy for me to talk long because, you know, my grandfather was a pastor and I got it in my blood. <laughs> so, you know, it's an answer to prayer that I'm not going to do that to you guys. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> but this is personal for me. You know, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you guys a question. Then I'm going to tell you guys a story. And then we're going to go over some strategies on how to recover this lost generation. Okay. All right, so you got to bear with me because like I said, I, I wrote this Monday. <laughs> so earlier this year, you know, I, I had a, I have, I have a ton of stories, but this is the one that really kind of hits home. Earlier this year, I got a message from my grandson, my oldest grandson. And he said, Grandpa, I need $100. And you know how teenagers just like the text. And, 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 I, and I said, wait, what? what? And he's like, it's an emergency. I said, well, you got to call me. <laughs> and of course, you know, teenagers don't want to use their voice. I said, I don't care. I'm not sending you no money. I said, you need to call me. So he picked up the phone, you know, eventually. He had to use a friend's phone because he was grounded. <laughs> and I heard in his voice that there was a problem. And he said, Grandpa, I owe these drug dealers money because I was selling drugs for them and I'm short a hundred dollars. You know, I hear stories like this all the time, but when it hits home, it just kind of takes your breath away. I mean, there's no real response to that, you know, but immediately I think like everybody else, you start to think, what did I do wrong? Is it the parents' fault? Is it the school's fault? What was he thinking? You know, I'm all in my head and everything, on my high horse, and, and then, you know, that little voice in the side of me said, um, you know, you're not that much different, bro. If you remember all the things you got into when you were younger and how that turned out. 
So when I sat down to uh, work on this, this presentation that is very, very personal for me. Oh, easy there. <laughs> you know, I wanted to share some things that you guys may not have heard dealing with substance abuse with our young people, you know. So when I sat down, I, I you know, like I said, I had the diagrams, I had everything up. <laughs> And the question I wanted to ask that I, you know, that I, that I had to think about myself was why do you guys think our young people are falling so easily into drugs and alcohol today? And I'll give you guys a minute to think about it. But like, you know, I'm definitely going to give some feedback because I just want to know if I'm on the right track here. Do, 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 do. <laughs> I hear the chatter. All right, I, can you say it a little louder, ma'am? <clears throat> okay, lots of values. Okay, environmental, home bringing, okay. Culture, yeah. Social media. Mm hmm Okay. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. stepping over at my side. <laughs> yeah, we, we definitely need more prevention strategies. I totally agree with that. Our, our society is very reactive um, and not so much preventative, um, which, is, which is a big issue I have. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. A lot of times I see <sighs> we will react to the symptoms and not the root. You know, um, there was a speaker I listened to and he talked about how um, we need to start doing root work instead of branch work, you know, and 
you know, our society, we, we, we know, we, we treat symptoms all day long, you know, um, which is everything, whether it's, you know, physical, medical, or uh, uh, emotional and mental. We treat symptoms. We hardly ever deal with root. And I remember talking to a, a, a psychiatrist and I said, um, what medication makes me feel like I'm not a loser? Yeah, you know, there's dead silence, you know, because, you know, we will promote medication like it's the cure. And so when I explained to people, you know, in some of my trainings, I said, look, you know, I'm not against medication. But, you know, in, especially in dealing with like anxiety or something, anxiety takes away the energy of anxiety. <laughs> it doesn't take away the fear that I can't handle anything in the world. That comes through training. That comes through education. You know, that comes through talk therapy. So when I hit up, you know, chat, chat, you know, AI, chat GPT, whatever, it came up with a lot of the similar reasons, you know, for, for teenagers. And here's some, here are some of what they said. They said peer pressure, family environment, experimentation, stress, mental health issues, low self-esteem, and media influence. But the interesting thing was, is I still didn't hear the issue that almost every client, young or old, I see in my office deals with, the issue I dealt with growing up. And it's not what you think. You see, I, I don't match a lot of the stereotypes for a black man that got involved with drugs and alcohol. You know, um, I got in trouble in the city, but I grew up in the country. You know, we used to steal rhubarb from the neighbors. You know, uh, yeah, it's the only one person knows what that is. <laughs> You know, um, <laughs> I got in trouble with gangs, but I was a scout leader in the Boy Scouts. I dealt with depression and suicidal thoughts, but I was a volunteer for the Make-A-Wish Foundation. I was a country boy that ran the city streets, a church kid addicted to sin, a black kid that went to a white school. I remember running into one of my old high school teachers and she said, I was the weird anomaly that could make friends with anybody. White, black, purple, yellow, nerds, jocks, rich, poor. I was an expert at blending in with the crowd. I was always funny. I could always make people smile or laugh. I mean, hell, I, I spoke two languages. You know, my second language was Caucasian. <laughs> you know, and my other language was just, you know, straight, you know, ghetto. You know, which you would see if you saw me playing spades late at night. <laughs> yeah, mm -mm. <laughs> I was a chameleon, so good, I could, I could hide in plain sight. In fact, my parents still don't believe everything that happened to me. Even though they've read my books and heard parts of my story on YouTube. You know, and, and I don't blame them. This is, this is part of the issue. I don't blame them because what parent really wants to believe their child is a hot nuclear mess? I recently spoke at a men's breakfast at Oak Ridge Church in Salisbury, and um, I sent the video to my sister kind of to test the waters because I really went in um, and just talking about, you know, my past, you know, and uh, she called back and she was in tears. I thought somebody died. You know, she was just, you know, so upset because she was like, I didn't know all that stuff happened to you. She said, I'm going to show mom. I said, oh, all right. <laughs> you know, and before mom even watched it, I don't even think she watched it yet. She told my sister, she said, you know, Willie tends to exaggerate. <laughs> and, and mind you, I've done a lot of therapy. <laughs> I was ready for that. I was okay, you know, because I know how perceptions can shift with pain, okay? And I don't think any parent wants to know how close their child came to losing everything. So there's, there, there, there might possibly be a little bit of denial. <laughs> My mom, she is and still is an amazing, hardworking woman. Probably too hard, you know, because she's not supposed to be working because the doctor said she had to stop working because of her seizures. But, you know, she still works at the church, still runs around, still cleans, you know. 
And when I was in high school, I just remember her always working with me and my siblings, you know, making us eat our vegetables, making me do my homework, even though I hated school, you know. I mean, I, w I just wasn't a good student. I didn't like to listen. I didn't like to study. I just wanted to hang out with my friends, have fun, flirt with the popular girls, and not get beat up by the bullies. That was what I wanted to do. My pops, which is also interesting, is he was there. In a world where fathers are absent, he was there. You know, my dad was a cop, a policeman, the popo. -po. <laughs> he built me and my siblings a tree house, took us camping. Yes, black people go camping. It's not a myth. <laughs> my old man even brought home these washing machine crates that the washing machines came in. And he got the spray paint and Christmas lights and, and cellophane, and he made us a spaceship that we would play in at night. It's crazy, you know, it's kind of like my family was the generic Cosbys, you know. <laughs> but when I think about how much I took for granted, it's, it just makes me shake my head. You know, and one thing my mom's not in denial about is, you know, how much of a fool I was back then. She'll admit that readily. <laughs> Doesn't want to talk about what happened, but she'll say, oh, he was a fool. <laughs> you see, one of the myths about addictions is that kids learn how to use from their environment. Okay, and sometimes that's true, absolutely. But the problem is, is this misleading perception leaves good parents totally unprepared to see the signs of addictions with their, athlete, with their athletic son or daughter who's on the swim or tennis team, with their child who's on the honor roll, with their teenager that's singing so good in the choir, they don't, they don't see it because they're not looking for it. And that's, that's one of the big problems I'm seeing today because this is affecting everybody, young and old. One of the main reasons for my success in my private practice is because I offer support systems for the family. You know, I give parents and loved ones a place to vent a place to ask questions, a place not to feel ashamed, where they can talk about their fears and frustrations. Because this is so overwhelming, you know. Oh, the fact that it's killing our babies left and right, it's, it's just, I mean, it's so serious that we don't even like to talk about it. What's it go to an Allen on me? Like, as if that's enough. And you know nobody's a counselor in the Al-Anon meeting. I mean, I'm not trying to turn a dog that, but nobody's a counselor in there. <laughs> it's just people try to help people. And, well, you, you know, I mean, if you go to church, that everybody's, you know, they try. <laughs> but you can get some, some jacked up advice in the back row in church. I mean, no, no lie. <laughs> I think the first sign for my mom that her firstborn son was a little dented, a little crooked, was how I ended up treating my grandfather. There's a picture of him up front. He was a small, quiet man who was a pastor and I was named after him. I remember his laugh and his smile and his soft, gravelly voice when he would tell us stories. He kinda sounded a little bit like Morgan Freeman. Just, just a little. <laughs> but when he got Parkinson's disease, he started to lose his ability to move, to remember, and to preach. So Grams decided to uh, have a family meeting and have him go to a nursing home because she couldn't lift him out of the tub anymore. She couldn't help him when he fell. And Grandpa was, was scared to go. You know, I think he had the same fears as, as most people that they're gonna die in a place surrounded by strangers. So the whole family worked out this plan where everybody was gonna go visit Grandpa so he didn't feel alone. Cause see, Grandpa still was fighting 
to get back to the life he had. He still was doing his exercises in the nursing home. <laughs> and everybody would show up to help him, you know, walk up and down the hallway to get stronger. And he'd make it a little bit further and you could see him smile. Everybody would show up, except me. And the crazy part about the story was I'm the only person that he still remembered by name. I don't know what made me special, but I would often miss my gift to go see grandpa to take him walking. And he'd be asking where Willie was, sitting on the end of his bed, alone in his room. My mom would often make excuses for me, because you know how, how moms do. And she would say, oh, he, he's in college or something. And I was in college. I just wasn't in college. I was doing the same thing I was doing in high school. I was lying. I was cheating. I was skipping class and running the streets. By the time I found the time to go see him, it was too late. And I don't even remember I went to the funeral. I do remember using the excuse to drown myself in more drinks. My mom asked me where I was, not just at the funeral, because mom thinks I was at the funeral, but you know, like I said, memory's a little, little weird. <laughs> But she was asking where I was at the nursing home. And I don't remember what lie I told her. I mean, I had so many of them. But she was so angry. She was so mad at me. He had a watch that he left to me, but she didn't even give it to me. Not for at least a couple years. She thought I was so selfish. And I was just not in the classical sense. You see, I was suffering from depression. And I didn't think anybody understood me. But truthfully, I didn't understand myself. I mean, because how could I have depression? I mean, y'all heard it. I mean, I, I came from a good home. I lived in a safe neighborhood. I went to a good school. What the hell was wrong with me? After my grandfather passed, I completely disconnected. I just allowed myself to fall. I lost my job, got college, stopped paying my bills, and continued trying to find every shortcut and cheat code that would make me happy with my life. But all I found was more and more disappointments and failures. You see, this, this is why I relate to the young people and the clients that come to my office today. Because I relate to being so disgusted and angry with yourself, you can't look in the mirror. I understand not being able to sleep at night because your mind won't stop reminding you of everything you've done wrong. I feel people's fear of never being good enough. And I know what it's like to be lost. When I trained counselors at Thresholds, I remember telling them to stop trying to relate to clients' addictions. This isn't a competition of who is the worst addict. Everybody's story is different. Everybody's trigger is different. Everybody, everybody's drug of choice is different. Nobody has the same heroin. What I told them to relate to is the emotions, the desperation, the loneliness, the frustration, and the fear. You see, the issue that Google AI doesn't talk about that I see in every client is the feeling of being lost. And when I talk to my youth, they've lost the reason why they're here, their purpose in life, the fact that they matter, the significance that gives them a reason to move beyond their pain, a reason to rise above. Many youths today battle with unhealthy comparisons and a lack of significance. 
My parents thought I was lazy and selfish. But those were just the surface issues, camouflaging a low self-worth that was, <laughs> it was worse than my credit score. I rediscovered my purpose the first time when I talked to a pastor at a homeless shelter. And it woke me up from the nightmare I was living in. I used the information to run an independent living skills group in Canton, Ohio. <laughs> I found out that when I tapped into a teenager's dreams and showed them the way, they lost interest in their distractions. It's interesting. I was, I was part of a program, um, a grant program uh, before COVID with a, with a school in Georgetown. I think it was Stephen Decatur. And I went into the classroom and I presented an addictions prevention program where I would go in and I would talk about deep topics about how an addiction happens, you know, the gateway emotions that lead to the gateway drugs that lead to having an addiction. You know, all the things you don't hear from that fried egg commercial. You know what I'm talking about? This is your brain. <laughs> You know, I talked about the stunning high school cheerleader that's living under a bridge now, making it real, real. And you know what was interesting? You know, when I was going from class to class, talking to the students, the kids came to me afterwards and asked me if they could volunteer to help other students with, with addictions or depression or anxiety. They were reacting to a call to action that I didn't even give. They just wanted someone to show them that there was more to life than just having fun. We don't have to accept addictions as part of our young people's journey. Experiment, experimenting with drugs and alcohol is not inevitable. It's not a rite of passage. And it happens, well, one of the reasons it happens is because of the teenage invulnerability complex. <laughs> and a lack of thorough understanding of what's out there, especially today. Not to mention the, high, the, the seductive high-risk situations that they're going to encounter. You know, you know they, the drug dealers don't look like in the movies. They, they look like other students. You know, the drugs don't look ugly. They, they, they look like candy. They got little cute nicknames like Scooby Snacks, you know, fun pills, you know, and, and they're not, they don't give them to you saying you're going to be hooked for the rest of your life and it's going to destroy you. They don't say that. They say, hey, yo, man, I see you're struggling with a lot of anxiety and stress. I got something for you. And if we're not teaching them those very scenarios, they're gonna say, okay, <laughs> yeah, I feel bad. They're not, go they're, they're not talking about yoga. They're not, hey, let's go to the gym, let's go to the boxing, let's go do some boxing and punch, punch that stress out. No, we're already legally a pill-popping society. And we don't talk about that. They are risk takers because they truly don't understand the value of what they're gambling. Eric Thomas is a famous motivational speaker and he once said, if a person's why is strong enough, it will overcome any how. So regardless of their background, their environment, their education, their economics, if their why is strong enough, they can push through that. But if they don't have a why, they will become a victim to everything because it's, it's a lack of purpose. A big part of destroying the grip of addictions with our kids is giving them educated choices. You know how they, they, the big argument is that uh, addictions is a choice? Well, it is and it isn't. It's not an informed choice. So does anybody, now I, got, I might have some people I'm 54, I, you know, I, mean, I got some people that relate to me. Does anybody remember the teenage pregnancy crisis? You know, where kids were having kids left and right. Oh, wow. Do you remember what we did? 
you know, after all the, the static and, and arguments about, you know, schools shouldn't teach kids, blah, blah, blah. You know, we came in, taught about condoms, taught about safe sex, you know, and, I, and in my program, I, I, I even bought a robotic baby. Oh, that was a game changer. <laughs> when they took that baby home to take care of it, to, to learn what it was like to have a newborn. And it was funny because the cool part is with a robotic baby, the, the, the parents didn't feel the need to have to deal with it. Because you know how you know how we are. You know, if the baby cry, we know what to do, but they're losing their mind. Okay, let me give give me the child, give me the baby. They didn't do that with the robot. They're like, oh mm. <laughs> this is your grade. <laughs> you deal with that robotic baby. And when they did that and did all these other classes, the pregnancy crisis started to reduce. It started to go down because there was more understanding education. And I remember, because I remember all the all the, the rumors and myths about the uh, the pull-out method. <laughs> you know. Or, or, you know, you, if you just kissed and did, you know, I mean, all kinds of stuff. I didn't know what, I didn't know what, I didn't know anything. Just like a lot of the kids. And so when I came in and I talked to people about really thoroughly educating them on what's in marijuana, why it is addictive, why you're playing with fate, sampling, especially today. The reason the drug dealer gives it to you for free the first time, there's a reason. Because I'm pretty sure you're coming back. The body is designed to remember extreme pain and extreme pleasure. And when I thoroughly start to explain that to people, to teens, yeah, especially if you can get them before they try anything, they're like, oh, okay. It's a, it's a game changer. Understanding that and understanding the real dangers and what it will cost them in the future is critical to helping them understand. It also requires educating the parents about the signs of what to look for, where to find help, how they can help it by being an active part of the prevention plan. I, I should say an effective active part, you know, because I, I have a lot of parents that are trying, but <sighs> Yeah, my mom's not gonna see this video. So my mom would try <laughs> to help by being more critical, you know, and not necessarily, you know, trying to talk to me and, and encouraging me and really trying to find out what's going on, you know. But we'll talk more about that later. But, you know, so when I, when I teach parents this, I teach them how to open their kids up and how to talk to them, you know. Also, the other thing for the sober family is I talk to them about their own self-care. You know, I talked to this one mother who was just burnt out, fried, crispy, you know, tired, stressed, because she was dealing with her daughter who had a real heroin issue. You know, she had overdosed at least two times. I mean, she had bloodshot eyes. I mean, she was just, and I said, you need to start taking care of yourself. And she's like, I don't have time. I'm like, you need to make time because you are the commercial for sobriety for your daughter. You're not only adding stress to yourself, but you're adding stress to your daughter. So we have to model what we're talking about. You know, going to the gym, having a counselor if we need it, you know, drinking water. <laughs> you know, all those things that help us make it through the day. You know, I think if my family would have known some of the things that I teach now and been able to help me understand my own significance, I wouldn't have fallen into using pills. I wouldn't have battled depression and suicide by myself. I wouldn't have been homeless twice, claimed bankruptcy, had my car repossessed, lost my house, been in the hospital three times for my heart, and been fired from several jobs. I didn't understand the purpose of school because I didn't think anything I did mattered. That was my issue back then without social media. We have a lot of people like me who have fallen through the cracks because they didn't address their emotional learning with their intellectual learning. You know, I think they call it so.
Yeah, you know, that's, that's a big thing today. Because we have a lot of intelligent kids that are stupid. Can I, can I say that here? Yeah. <laughs> I have a lot of adults <laughs> that are very intellectual and just dumb. You know, <laughs> messaging, texting, snapping, swiping, TikToking, our deepest emotional dreams and heartbreaks in 60 second clips. But we've edited all the blemishes out. <laughs> Now, I don't preach. Now we've got AI and the metaverse creating simulations of reality when we haven't even learned how to deal with this reality. This is what we're dealing with. This is what they're, they're dealing with. This is what they're immersed in. This is why we desperately need people who care. <laughs> Individuals who still have a heart to help someone like me after being homeless the second time. I found good people to help me put my life back together. But that's a story for another time. Right now, I just want to share some tools real quick on what I learned and how I got back from the brink of drugs, alcohol, suicide, and poverty. I'm, I'm still working on the poverty part. <laughs> so what I call, I call it the uh, generation, the Gen Z Impact Initiative. It is a teen empowerment program I'm developing with three key points that changed my life and I base the core of my counseling practice on. The first one is called the Crossroads Awakening, okay? This is the revelation some people get when they hit rock bottom. You know the, how they say you gotta hit rock bottom? Well, that's, that's a piece of it, but you, hit, you, can't, you have to hit rock bottom with the informed choices you could make once you get there to get out of rock bottom. You know, just losing everything is not enough. Trust me, I, I've lost everything. I spent a lot of time in my life looking at the things I've done. When we recognize the truth of our situations, we have to come to the crossroad where we can make the decision of whether we're gonna make our life matter or continue to make our life miserable. Learning to break free from the cultural norms of low status quo is the hardest step anybody can make in the social media today. Dealing with all these things, all the political polarization, the phone, the, the, the iPhone addiction, the, the, the pandemic destabilization. I mean, if you think about everything that's going on, I can barely process and handle all the stress. And I'm somewhat well adjusted. I can't imagine the immature mind handling it without any resources. And they don't have any resources. And so it's easy for the dealer to come and say, I got something to help you with that. Ignoring the impact of stress on these guys, these, these young people, is the reason why substance abuse is rising. We're making it easy for the drug dealers. We need to start giving them choices instead of consequences so they can learn how to rise above it all. Because they can be the best of us if we're willing to invest the best in them. The second one is developing grit for the grind. Uh, we gotta have some backbone. We gotta teach them how to have backbone to push through. Getting them into an environment that empowers higher learning on all levels. I'm talking about emotional, spiritual, physical, financial, and intellectual. I had to learn this lesson several times because behind my issues was my tremendous capacity for self-pity. I was an expert at feeling sorry for myself. I did it 24-7. <laughs> and because of that, it fueled my unlimited supply for excuses. Now, I'm sure we know some people like that today. <laughs> it's, <laughs> that's where I talk about the gateway emotions. One of those is self-pity, you know. <laughs> I couldn't handle the slightest problem because I had learned the habit of evading and escaping my problems instead of dealing with them. Our society has developed a taste for distractions, so we ignore all levels of stress. When, the, when, when COVID happened and people had to go home, <laughs> that's when I discovered I was an essential worker. I thought I was going home too. No, there's no, you need to go work. <laughs> and I was like, what is going on? When people, 
lost the distraction of work. And I had to be home with my family that I, I said I loved. <laughs> it was rough. It was, I was doing family counseling like crazy. Yes. It, and, and it was just crazy like that. And so <laughs> to deal with those things, to learn how to deal with them, is part of the process of learning to give people, to teach them the grit, to teach them that stress is not necessarily bad. The pressure can turn you into a diamond instead of dirt if you do it right. All those setbacks, those disappointments and failures can be turned into skill building exercises that will strengthen our weak areas while also inoculating us for future situations where your plan doesn't go according to plan. Like, mine never do. You know, I'm already ready. I got plan C, I got plan D ready, <laughs> you know? But I know a lot of people, they're like, you know, well, plan A didn't work, I might as well just throw it all in. You know, I'm just, might as well just go ahead and use what I used to do for, for whatever, because it's, it's just not my life, it's just not gonna work. There is no stress-free lifestyle. You know, one of the things I learned in boxing was how to pivot when your adversary is coming at you hard and you need to, to shift with the problem, you know. You have to adjust and be flexible. These are the things that I teach people, young and old. Developing a, peer, a positive peer group to catch the outliers is necessary. Field trips that incorporate tactile learning to learn new career possibilities is a game changer. Mind and body programs, exercise, yoga, bubble bath. <laughs> you know, these things work. But if we're not an example of it, how can we teach it? You know, I have people that come work in my office and one of the first things I ask a, a counselor is, what is your self-care program? And most people will look at me like, I say, what? <laughs> and I'm like, I can't have you here. Because, I mean, I've been doing this forever. And I plan on continuing. And I remember I was telling somebody, they, they, they wanted an interview for a director job. And I said, um, they said, what is one of your, your greatest skills? And I said, I've developed the skill to be burnout proof. Yeah, that, that made everybody blink. <laughs> because I think the other, other person that was there, they're like, I'm burnout right now. <laughs> And I said, hey, and I can teach you, but it is a process. <laughs> the last one is called pattern repurposing. Okay, this is probably the, the, the most important one, but you can't get to there without the other two. And so it's, it's really wordy. <laughs> I wrote, developing an effective life modification with practice. Practice doesn't make perfect. Practice makes permanent. I have practiced depression, anxiety, escaping stress with substance abuse, <laughs> lying to myself, <laughs> avoiding accountability most of my life. And you know how I got good at it? It was through practice. Through years and years of replaying the same behaviors over and over again. We recreate ourselves when we recognize the pattern and recycle them to change it so we can have optimal results. I mean, no, none of the legends, none of the scientists, none of the, uh, the, the, the celebrities, nobody who's done anything renowned in life did it without tragedy and trauma in their background. I mean, if you look it up, I mean, you know, Michael Jordan, I mean, he was kicked off the basketball team. You know, uh, I mean, there's so many of them. You know, Eric Thomas, he, I think he, he, he makes 200,000 every time he speaks. But he was homeless eating out of trash cans. You know, David Goggins, he's another, another speaker. You know, he, he was dyslexic and he cheated the whole time in school. You know, no one gets there. Rachel Ray was homeless. Steve Harvey had $13 in his pocket. No one gets there until they learn to recycle this stuff to relearn, it, to repurpose their negative habits 
and use them for strength instead of sickness. It sounds easy, but this is where you have to create this empowering culture around you. So you know how they say teamwork makes the dream work? That is 120% true. You have to develop a squad of mentors, encouragers, peers, and even haters that will teach individuals how to manage social resources instead of being afraid and controlled by them. This is life. You know, not everybody's gonna be your fan. And like I said, my mom said that I exaggerate. <laughs> you know, and that stuff used to crush me in the past, you know. <laughs> but now it's just like, that's just mom. <laughs> you guys are the front line in dealing with this in society. You face all the dysfunction, frustration, and confusion, and I know it feels like it's a losing battle. I know you aren't appreciated enough for what you do, but it does make a difference. I just recently worked with a young lady who uh, graduated early. Beautiful, smart, creative, athletic, you know, honors class. No one would know that she had so much anxiety she didn't want to live someday. And I'd like to say I was the reason that she's successful today. I'm not. <laughs> I came in at the end of the story because what got her to me was a teacher. She said a teacher saw her and took the time to get behind her mask to talk to her and encourage her. You know, we, we, you know, when she was going away to college, you know, we all met, you know, she invited us out with her family, I mean, you know, and we all met, and I got to meet this guy, and, you know, I mean, I'm good, but he made me feel like I was a kid, <laughs> you know. He was just, he just was so wise. <laughs> and he, he, he had all this real cool stuff to tell her on her way out, and, and I was like, I, didn't, I, didn't, I just brought you a card, you know. <laughs> but this is what I'm talking about. These are the people you need in your life. It's not a one-stop show. You know, even when I develop programs, my programs work in tandem with the programs and community. Wherever I'm at, whether I'm in Ohio, Florida, here. I am not the, it's not the Will Singleton show. I work with everybody, because I can't do it all. I don't want to do it all. Car payment, okay. <laughs> You know, when she, uh, when she went, she's, uh, she's coming back and she said, I, I can't wait to tell you how good I'm doing in school. I said, that's great, that's great. And so you never know how many lives you're gonna impact, which is why we can't stop trying to reach them. Because the cost of failure is devastating. You know, and I was going to, <laughs> I was gonna hurt y'all today. I was gonna bring a couple stories that are real heart wrenchers. Yeah, yeah, the one lady's like, oh, don't do that. <laughs> but instead, I wanted to give you something that actually inspires hope, okay? So I had one of my clients that graduated, and I don't have any, any identifying information that sent something for you guys to listen to. Uh, let me just find it real quick. And it's just an example of what people can do when they recognize their potential. Let's see if I can get this right. Anger turns to sadness, sadness turns to anger. For the moment, I'm just thinking about my list of hangers. All the times I should have did this or did that. What would be the cost of mine if I could ever go back? Like, I'm not the same, I hope you know that. Pictures of you in my mind like I'm talking Kodak. Like, I wish I wasn't so angry. Wish I didn't play the victim. Hope you at least understand me. Like, you showed me love and attention. I showed you all my past problems. I was dumb and relentless. Like, hurt people, hurt people. I was blinded by the lies and all the times I seen evil. Like, uh, and trust me, I can see people, but 
I guess I didn't see you clear enough. Sitting back thinking all the dust be clearing up. Fuck, it's got me tearing up. Trust issues on my mind. Got me bugging, got me overthinking all the time. And it's where the lies, who to trust, I hope I find. Uh, look, I just want a peace of mind. Like, trust issues on my mind. Got me bugging, got me overthinking all the time. And it's where the lies, who to trust, I hope I find. Like, uh, I just want a peace of mind. Like, I'm feeling guilty as fuck. Feeling anxious like I'm bad, but that part of me's done. It's like I'm living in the past, so I just can't give it up. And in my dreams, I see you all the times, I can't get enough. Like, I still don't understand. But after losing you, I finally turned into a man. I'd like to thank you all the time for giving me a chance. And even when I did you wrong, you never changed the plan. I still don't understand. I wish that I could go back. But what would be the cost of mine if I could ever go back? Like, I guess it happened for a reason. Now I think about you every season, I'm sorry. You know, as of today, he has 22 months clean from opiates and suicidal thoughts. And he is making music about mental health issues and addictions. What we do as care professionals does make a difference. So I always like to end my speeches with words I try to live by in honor of my grandfather. So here they are. We come as one, but we represent 1,000. The choice is whether we represent 1,000 curses or 1,000 blessings. Will we live broken or will we keep pressing? We can stop being a victim of people, places, and things. And we can recognize our power as the future leaders, queens, and kings. No longer accepting trauma as the death sentence of our dreams. We can recycle our pain and hardship and make success our new theme. So say with me now, so you don't forget. I am a miracle in the making, and I will no longer live in regret. My name is William Singleton. Thank you for having me.